Well, good morning again. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about testosterone replacement therapy and focal therapy. Um, so as many of you know, there are, are numerous men who suffer from hypogonadism. And remember that if you truly meet the definition of hypogonadism, not only do you have to have the signs and symptoms, but you also have to have low testosterone value. We know that roughly 4% of men under the age of 50, 8% of all men over the age of 50 will meet this criteria. Many of these men will have prostate cancer, they will undergo focal therapy, and they will come to you in your office and say, I would like to have my testosterone replacement therapy, and how will you respond? Well, I think you have to look at the literature and see how do we treat other patients with prostate cancer, which is radical prostatectomy, radiation, brachytherapy, and do we give those men testosterone, and how do they respond? And I'm gonna show you the data and the literature that we have today. So I just want to start out, this is a Canadian study. I think this is very interesting because 10 years ago when I started giving these talks, I said, how many of you in the audience would give men testosterone after a radical prostatectomy? Very few hands would go up. And now more and more as we give these lectures, more and more hands go up in the audience to say, I feel more comfortable in giving men testosterone after a radical prostatectomy. But this is a study giving testosterone to men on active surveillance, which I thought was pretty interesting. If you look at some of the important points here, would you offer testosterone to men on active surveillance? 65% of the urologists would say yes, I would give men testosterone on active surveillance. Uh, have you offered testosterone to men on active surveillance? 65%, 35% yes. And then, is it safe to prescribe testosterone for men who've received curative treatment for prostate cancer after radical prostatectomy, radiation therapy, or brachytherapy? And if you look at these numbers, majority of these urologists would say, yes, it is safe to give these men testosterone after these therapies. So I just want to start out by telling you that if you did a literature search today and you looked at the incidence of prostate cancer in those men being treated with testosterone is identical to those men not being treated with testosterone. That's a very important point. Study after study, meta-analysis after meta-analysis, there's not been a single study to show that those men being treated with testosterone have a higher incidence of prostate cancer than those men not being treated with testosterone. This is a registry study that came out last year. It's called the RIME study. It was a, a well-received study in Europe looking at men, roughly 1,000 men, 750 men received testosterone therapy, and they looked at the proportion of uh, prostate cancer biopsy positive. They found that roughly 37.5% of, of those men receiving testosterone had positive prostate biopsies during the course of the study versus 37% who are not on TRT. Again, no study can show to date that those men receiving testosterone have a higher incidence of prostate cancer than those men not receiving testosterone. Well, what does the literature show on testosterone therapy after prostate cancer therapy? So these are some of the earlier studies by Kaufman and Agarwal. They were very small studies, seven patients, 10 patients, no recurrence of prostate cancer. I published one later on uh, with 57 patients. Again, no recurrence of prostate cancer. I did publish another one with 103 patients after radical prostatectomy, and we had um, four prostate cancer recurrences, and I will show you that study here in just a second. And the other ones are on brachytherapy, radiation therapy, and active surveillance. But I do think it's important that you understand this literature, and I'm gonna go through many of the important ones today. So let's get started. So this is brachytherapy. Dr. Shirazi was the first one to show in 2006 that men receiving brachytherapy did not have an increased risk of prostate cancer. It was the first study in brachytherapy. Um, none of the patients had to stop testosterone therapy uh, with, for prostate cancer recurrence or progression. It's a small series, mind you. It's only 31 patients. Remember that none of these studies are placebo controlled. It's a very important point. I have not a single randomized placebo control study to show you today. It's a very important point. This is a small series by Morales. Again, five patients getting external beam radiation, no increase in prostate cancer. This is a small series that I published with my fellow Dr. Pastorsak. 13 patients receiving radiation therapy or brachytherapy. Again, no significant increase in prostate cancer progression or recurrence. Dr. Morgenthaler's group also did a small series with brachytherapy, 20 patients. Most of these men were Gleason 6 or 7, one with the Gleason 8, follow-up of 31 months. These men did see an improvement in overall erectile function, but again, no prostate cancer recurrence. 
And then this is the largest series that we published with men getting radiation and testosterone supplementation. And this is a, 98 patients that we could find that received testosterone therapy with radiation or brachytherapy. Uh, majority of these men were low Gleason, five, six, or seven. We did have a small percentage of these patients having Gleason eight or Gleason nine. We did have pretty decent follow-up, above 41 months. Um, but we did have some men, we had 6% of these men did have a biochemical recurrence. Now, if you look carefully at those six men that had a biochemical recurrence, you'll see that a majority of these men, or at least three of these men, had androgen deprivation therapy, and uh, uh, we don't know the Gleason score on the other two, but they did have androgen, androgen deprivation therapy. If you remember from my lecture yesterday, when you give men androgen deprivation therapy and you drop their serum testosterone levels, when you give them their testosterone level back, their PSA goes up. Absolutely, no question. And you have to stomach it. Every three months it keeps going, finally it will plateau. But if you don't realize that, you're gonna call it a biochemical recurrence, right? And you're gonna stop. So again, you have to be very careful in these patients because when they get androgen deprivation therapy, expect the PSA rise. Now, what about radical prostatectomy? This question comes up all the time. Is it safe to give men testosterone after radical prostatectomy? As I mentioned earlier, the first several studies show that there was no risk, but the more recent one that we published, we had four biochemical recurrences. And I wanna show you that study because I think there's several important points here. This is a study that we published in 2013, and we did something quite unconventional. We treated patients with high-risk prostate cancer with testosterone. So what do I mean by high-risk prostate cancer? Gleason 8 or higher, positive surgical margins or positive lymph nodes. They were hypogonadal, and they requested their testosterone supplementation back. We had 103 men that were hypogonadal. We treated them with testosterone. We had 49 eugonadal controls that had undergone a radical prostatectomy at this time. In the testosterone treatment group, we had 77 men who were lower intermediate risk, but 26 men who received testosterone were this high risk group. In the control group, we had 34 men that were non-high risk and 15 men that were in this high risk group. What did we find? We had only 12 biochemical occurrences, but this was only in high risk patients after 36 months. If you received testosterone, the biochemical recurrence rate was 15% after 36 months. If you did not receive testosterone, the biochemical recurrence rate was 53% after 36 months. Now I have to stop you here because this is pretty interesting. 36 months, high risk, Gleason 8 or higher, positive surgical margins, positive lymph nodes, and you're telling me the recurrence rate is only 15.3%. That's quite low quite low for a very high risk population after three years. In fact, if you look at all the patients who've received testosterone after some form of prostate cancer therapy, brachytherapy or surgery, we can count about 346 patients. The recurrence rate is roughly 2.8%. Very low, and every time we submit these manuscripts, the editor says, Kara, I don't believe you. Your recurrence rate is way too low for this population. Are you suggesting in any way that testosterone could be protective because your occurrence rates are way too low? It's an interesting thought. So if you look at the basic science data, there is some data to suggest that testosterone may be protective. Certain studies showing that membrane androgen receptor activation induces apoptosis and regression of prostate cancer cells. Other basic science data showing that androgens are able to trigger inhibition of prostate cancer cell proliferation at higher concentrations. And I think the most interesting study was Dr. Chu's study. Androgens cause growth suppression and the reversion of androgen-independent tumors to androgen-dependent tumors. Now, I had the privilege of giving grand rounds at John Hopkins several years ago, and I was fortunate to meet a physician by the name of Dr. Den Mead. And do you know how Dr. Den Mead treats metastatic prostate cancer? He treats metastatic prostate cancer with high doses of testosterone. FDA-approved, IRB-approved study. Patients come in, metastatic disease, they get high doses of testosterone. I want to show you two of his studies. This was the first one he published in 2015. These are 14 patients with castrate-resistant prostate cancer. All these patients will receive androgen deprivation therapy, and then they'll receive on top of that high doses of testosterone, 400 milligrams IM every three months. He calls this BAT, or bipolar androgen therapy. 
What did he find with bat therapy in these patients? 50% of these patients had a reduction in their PSA. 50% of these patients had significant improvement in metastatic disease seen on radiograph. Again, pretty amazing. You wouldn't imagine 10 years earlier treating men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer with high doses of testosterone. His second study that came out, this is 29 asymptomatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer patients. So they had to have low metastatic burden or non-metastatic with biochemical recurrence. Gave them six months of androgen deprivation therapy followed by 400 milligrams of testosterone IM every four weeks for three months. Again, that's BAT therapy. And he met his endpoint. 60% of the patients roughly met the endpoint that these men had a PSA of less than four after 18 months. And not surprising, majority of these men had a significant improvement in their quality of life and their erectile function. I just want to show you two simple studies that came out of my lab at Baylor. We take LINCAP cells and we put LINCAP cells in petri dishes and we give different amounts of testosterone in each one of these petri dishes. And we see something pretty interesting. If you look at castrate or no testosterone at all, uh, the levels are quite low, but if you start giving testosterone to these LINCAP cells, the prostate cancer cells grow. They absolutely grow and statistically significant. But as you give higher and higher doses of testosterone, you see greater and greater levels of suppression of prostate cancer cell growth. We call this the inverted U, where maybe castrate is good, maybe eugonadal is good, but hypogonadal may be bad. Again, I'll show you another slide. These are LINCAP cells with uh, no testosterone. You add testosterone to these LINCAP cells, they tend to grow, that is true. At higher levels of testosterone, you see prostate cancer growth suppression. We then decided to take these studies and do it in animals. And what would this be also germane in vivo? So we took roughly 200 mice. We had normal controls. We had orchiectomy. Orchiectomy plus low dose to simulate a hypogonadal state. And orchiectomy plus high dose testosterone pellets to simulate more of a eugonadal state. These animals received 5 million LINCAP cells injections in their back, and these were, animals were followed for almost three months. These are the testosterone pellets that we place. Uh, we measure the tumor on the back, and we get the size as well. What did we find? So if you look at tumor incidence rate in normal controls, roughly 50%, orchiectomy, clearly protective. If you remove the testosterone, it de does decrease the tumor incidence rate. If you give testosterone back, yes, the tumor incidence rate goes back up again. That is true. But when you give higher doses of testosterone, you again see a suppression in tumor incidence rate. What did we find? Very similar to what we found in vitro is what we found in vivo. I call it the inverted U, where we believe that maybe castrate is okay, maybe eugonadal okay, but in my opinion, the middle range may be dangerous. So I get this comment all the time, you can't tell me that it's safe based on these retrospective small series studies. I agree, you have to do a randomized placebo controlled trial. So many years ago, we started the first randomized placebo controlled trial giving men testosterone or placebo after a radical prostatectomy. Now the FDA was pretty strict. Um, I fought with them because I really believe that you have to get the treatment on early within the six months and they wanted to uh, have it at a year. We compromise that they would let us treat men as early as three months, but you have to have two undetectable PSAs within three months. And I'm allowed to treat patients with a Gleason 3 plus 4, but not any higher. So again, 3 plus 3, 3 plus 4, but no patients with a 4 plus 3. One comment on this is that many patients who receive testosterone supplementation uh, will get a biochemical recurrence whether you give them testosterone or not. And I do think it's important to counsel patients appropriately. I tell them there are no randomized placebo-controlled trials. There are not. And until they are, are randomized placebo-controlled trials, I cannot tell you that it is 100% safe because we don't have that data. So we don't consent our patients because the... Um, our, our Baylor legal team said consents don't hold up very much in court, but they did tell us to put one line in there saying that the patient understands that the risk of prostate cancer progression and recurrence is unknown and still wishes to proceed at this time. So we do counsel them on this. 
Just a comment on the risk of occult prostate cancer in the community. We started, we did the first active surveillance study. This was in 2011. We gave 13 men testosterone who were on active surveillance. Uh, they had a Gleason, most of them three plus three. One had a three plus four. We followed these patients for 24 months. What did we find? We found no significant change in PSA, no change in prostate volume, no cancer progression was seen in any of these individuals, and no cancer could be identified in 54% of these patients on repeat biopsy. Now let's be honest, we know that the risk of occult prostate cancer in the community is one in six, at least. And if you are treating 60 patients in your practice with testosterone, I promise you, you are giving 10 patients with active prostate cancer testosterone. There's no question. But today, there's been not a single study to show that those men being treated with testosterone have a higher incidence of prostate cancer than those men not being treated with testosterone. So every one of you is still are doing exactly what we're doing. You're treating men on active surveillance with no detrimental cause causes as up to now. And that's exactly what we found in this study. There have been several other studies on active surveillance. This is a little bit larger with 28 patients on active surveillance receiving testosterone therapy. And I will just sum it up. Dr. Morgenthaler's group also found no differences in prostate cancer progression in men on active surveillance or receiving testosterone versus those men not receiving testosterone. I've spent this whole time talking about safety. Is it safe to give testosterone to these men? But we really have to, cannot ignore the other important factor. Is there any benefit? And I will tell you today that a hypogonadal man has a significant disadvantage in recovering his erectile function following a radical prostatectomy compared to a eugonadal patient. We know that testosterone is critical in terms of recovery of overall erectile function. It regulates nitric oxide synthase, it regulates phosphodiesterase type 5 activity within the penile tissue, extremely important for penile nerve function, and very important for venoocclusive erectile function. In fact, hypogonadal state will result in fat deposition within the tunica albuginea. It results in decrease in apoptosis of cavernosal smooth muscle, and it is a true cause for ED in many patients. So I want to show you one study that's important. This is by uh, Dr. Trache. This is an animal study, and these animals are treated with seven days with vehicle, testosterone, or estradiol after bilateral orchiectomy, and he looked at the smooth muscle content. And I think this kind of illustrates the point. This is control. This is castrate. This is when you give back the testosterone to these animals. So again, I just think it's important that you realize that when you look at the control, you look at the cast rate, and when you're giving back the testosterone, you seem to preserve the, the cavernosal smooth muscle, and where the cast rate sees a significant increase in fibrosis. Um, finally, remember, for the past 10 years, uh, my specialty really is in uh, sexual medicine, and I spend quite a bit of time in, in rehabilitating many of these patients after radical prostatectomy and prostate cancer surgery. For 10 years, we focused on three things, if you look at the literature. Nerves, trabecular smooth muscle, and endothelium. It's a repeat concept in this field of uh, penile rehabilitation. How can we improve these three to recover erectile function? But if you look at testosterone carefully, what does it do? It has a profound positive effect on all three. It's nerves, trabecular smooth muscle, and endothelium. So again, we believe it's very important to get the medication on early within the first six months. So in conclusion, there's currently no convincing evidence that testosterone promotes the initiation of prostate cancer in hypogonadal men. Hypogonadal men receiving testosterone after history of prostate cancer appear to have low recurrence rates of prostate cancer and may be considered in men with a history of focal therapy. A large randomized placebo-controlled trial assessing the effects of TRT on prostate cancer is needed. And androgens may play a key role in recovery of erectile function following radical prostatectomy. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>